Morant. Oh! A jawbreaker! Goes by Bullock! Oh! Drops the oh! sledgehammer! Good bucket. Kobe Bryant on a racket! Oh! It's a physical game. in the face of Kawhi Leonard. Explosion, the finish. Down to three, down to two. It's a three. Good! Good! He got it! James Harden, a flamethrower! This guy's unbelievable. He is so fun to watch. Hello guys, welcome to Cut the Nets episode 13. I'm Jeremy, as we have Brian, my co-host. Uh, we have a new guest on the podcast. This is Naj. She's a new BSP writer. And uh, we also have Andy on the podcast coming in just in time. Look at him. We just started. Let Andy. <laughs> What's going on? All right. Uh, we have quite a bit of t- uh, things to talk about to get through. We didn't record last week. Um, Brian was on a break during spring break, so uh, we had to do a little spring break uh, hiatus. But, um, yeah, we have quite a bit of things to talk about. Uh, Naj, actually, tell us uh, what you cover for BSP. Um, So, currently, I'm doing Miami Heat and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, I've spoke uh, about, like, doing opinion pieces on the Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, in particular, like, comparing the eras because there's so much greatness throughout the Stiller, you know, uh, we got six championships, of course. I don't have to talk about that. But there's so many players from top to bottom uh, if you look at the different positions. We'll have to see how much you write about the Miami Heat because um, they feel like a team that, are, that should be better than what their record says. True, Especially yeah. right now. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think, too, uh, to piggyback off of that, has been so inconsistent with the injuries, which you can't control those things. But uh, the play is, like, concerning at times, but it's also, like, exciting. So it's, like, a, a little bittersweet to be a fan. Yeah. Do you think that – um? do you think that they still might make a – might make some noise in the playoffs? In the playoffs, um, I think the East is pretty tough right now. Like – um, and the balance and talent, but I think they could make potentially a run. I think they're, I'm going to say their ceiling could pop, possibly be the uh, conference finals, uh, but I think also the floor could be maybe second round exit. Second round exit. I mean, that's a that's a pretty decent um, – prediction for that because i mean they're they're not really in the uh, top five seed at the moment they're i believe the what seventh seed they're seven yeah, yeah so seventh seed. Would they, matched um, up with as of right now they would play the Is 76ers they? assuming they like win the bubble or not the bubble the play in staying as a seven seed i mean they've had some good games as of late they're six and four in the last ten um they have a pretty good uh, home record as well so uh Against the Hawks, it would probably be a pretty easy win at, uh, at home. Um, they actually might pass the Nets, considering the Nets probably have um, no future as of right now, except the, to rebuild. You know. Hey, Brooklyn Bridges has been hooping. He has, but does he save the team? Uh, no. I mean, I think they're more of a retooling. Like, that term doesn't get talked about enough. But I think they're retooling because – they have a lot. They shedded a lot of cap space by trading Durant and Kyrie. They have like a bunch of good players. Like, like their whole lineup is pretty much good players. But they just they and like they can easily find a star. The uh, they can trade some of the guys. Like I imagine you keep Bridges, but you could trade like a a Ben Simmons or even just release him. He, <laughs> release him. <laughs> just release you that can, guy. Uh, the team is better. Yes. You can trade Cam Johnson. Claxton is playing the best basketball of his career. Like they can get the star uh, easily next year, but they'll, like on downfall, like playing devil's advocate is I don't even know if a star would want to play for the Nets, considering how they've handled stars and treated them last uh, lately, like James Harden, Durant, Kyrie, like all sour relationships that uh, ended poorly. So it's kind of like a trust factor. But theoretically, I think the Nets are retooling rather than rebuilding because. 
they're kind of just taking a hit on this year, and I think that this is going to be a much different Nets team next year. I mean, I'm not saying Mikhail Bridges is, like, the franchise player. He's played a lot better since coming to the Nets, but that's because there's really no star there. So it's kind of it's kind of just been, you know, whoever can play the best type of basketball in Brooklyn uh, with regard to Cam Thomas and, and Nick Claxton and um, – well, Ben Simmons too, if it's, if, because he's you know, funny he's, one. If, yeah, yeah, uh, man, that that is that has to be a thirty for thirty documentary. Ben Simmons just the like yeah, the downfall of Ben Simmons. You know, a first overall pick out for the first year of his season, wins Rookie of the Year, and then people make fun of him because he was supposed to win. He was supposed to be Rookie of the Year season prior, and Donovan Mitchell should have won that. And then yeah, just talked about how he can't shoot. But he has everything else is great, like Magic Johnson. And then after his back surgery, and also the wide open layup that he should have made against the Hawks, that's a very monumental moment. Even though it's a small little split second, it's a very monumental moment. I think that pretty much was the downfall of Ben Simmons. That was career. the inflection point, not only for like a yeah. opinion of him, but just honestly how he was playing and stuff like that. Yeah, that was like the stock market crash. Exactly. Like, yeah, right, no, like there. that was the crater, like you said. Yeah, that, yeah. I was just being brutal for his sense. Yeah, and, you know, since then, he's just been a shell of himself. I was like, all oh, those memes when, like, Dwight Howard wore shooting sleeves but can't shoot. Like, it's exactly <laughs> like that. Yeah. And he's amphibious, man. Come on. He's, he's <laughs> amphibian? Yeah. He's living outside the water now. But, but actually, though, like, I just remember watching him in, like, the Summer League and, like, his LSU highlights. And, like, he was pulling from outside pretty confidently. Like, you know, I'm not saying he was, like, a great shooter, but, like, he was able to take those shots. And in the NBA these days, um, unless you were somebody built like Shaquille O'Neal or something like that, you have to be able to shoot outside. He was able to take those shots. You know, and he was still doing his Ben Simmons. He was able to run the floor. He was able to get uh, people involved, whether it's in a two-man game or actually just trying to uh, spread around like a motion offense or something like that. But... I, what happened? Is it is it like are we talking like a case of the yips? Because you you look at like a guy like Markel Fultz, he's kind of out of that now, right? Kind of seems like yeah. I, I think, I think so. it's the pressure of that harsh crowd in Philly. I mean, because like mm. when he was back mm. and like and won Rookie of the Year and was like like you said, Andy, like he was he was balling and like confidently shooting. That was when Philly was bad, so there wasn't and they were still in their whole seven year trust the process. It's kind of like the Mets, like it's always next year, Mono, and like trust the process. Like they were, there wasn't much pressure on Ben Simmons to be the superstar and like get them to the finals. But then as they got better and as Embiid broke out, um, Philadelphia is just like a harsh and crap environment, whether it's baseball, football, basketball, hockey. Uh, the fans don't treat them nicely. Uh, and if you're bad, they're going to let you hear it. And that's kind of when Ben Simmons, because even like you said, Markel Fultz, He's in Orlando now, and he he's not he's not like a great player like he was like based off where he should be from his draft position, yeah. but he looks like a much more confident player, and I think Ben Simmons is kind of shooting is kind of seeing those woes now. I think if you went to like a small market team, I think you could be a serviceable player as opposed to being begged to be benched. I think you should go to the Spurs. Hmm. I think he needs to get Greg Popovich up. Like he needs Popovich to, to to whip him in into shape. Right? Yeah, I want to add too because I think uh, Andy and Brian they t- they touched on good points about Ben Simmons. Uh, first with Andy being that his confidence, you know, I think that took a hit, and then the market of Philadelphia, you know, just to piggyback off of Brian, like it's crucial. You know, like if you don't play well, you're gonna hear about it, and I think. He's not the type of person to take that criticism well. Yeah, not for sure. I mean, speaking of the, the 76ers, they're, they're a crazy threat right now. They're streaking. I mean. It's scary. It's, it's downright it's, scary. Is it scary? Or is it just well, like, you know, because it's March and it's like the dog days of basketball and, you know, they're just winning because teams aren't trying as hard right now. That, that is true. That's a good point, yeah. Um, I mean, the, the stretch that Embiid's putting up, I mean, I, I, I was always the proponent for, like, the Jokic MVP or whatever, but just the, the stretch that Joel's putting up is just, I don't know. Like, are, are we, are we going to see this carry into the playoffs? Because if so, I mean, you know, is there really a guy 
that are a guy or a team that's really going to be able to slow them down? Like, do you see any significant resistance coming against Philly until, you know, they reach a, I guess any one of the top three teams. So we're talking Boston or Milwaukee along with Philly. Is it, they really going to see any resistance until then? I don't know. That's why I think it's scary is they might not really have a real threat up until we get to, what is that? Like May where that starts to happen for semis and conference finals. They might actually complete the trifecta of, of, of going to the NBA finals and losing, you know, against a, a Western team. You know, I mean, that is something I would love to see happen still. Because I just want more more sorrows for Philadelphia fans for all their sports teams, besides, of course, hockey and... and uh, no, hockey. the Eagles lost the Super Bowl, and then the Phillies yeah. lost the... Uh, the World Series. World Series, yeah. I mean, yeah, so be nice I think, little... like, the Philadelphia soccer team lost the championship, too, but I don't really want soccer like that. But Yeah, I, I don't either. I mean, MLS is kind of just like, unless it's the World Cup. I'm it's watching. child's play. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's child's play. play. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, honestly. Yeah, get, so get a pint of beer and watch Premier League like a man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you call it the Premier League. You know what, the, what kind of league it's called. I, oh. I don't know. To be honest, I don't even watch it. I just know a bunch of people that do, and like I just try to blend in in conversations. Because like NBA, you know, I'll talk about like any player. If it's like some guy that was drafted 56 overall five years ago, I'll talk about him for like 15 minutes. But they're like, oh yeah, like what do you think of like this team in like Premier League? I'm like, they uh they, they kick it well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. They they, yeah. they don't they don't uh they don't miss. <laughs> sometimes they miss. sometimes they miss and sometimes they don't. Um, I also hate it when they do offsides. It's it's terrible. I think they should take that out of the game. That's like that's like restricting fast breaks in basketball. Would you imagine like LeBron dunking and like he's not allowed because he's behind? The <laughs> like how oh, awful shit. would that be? Like you get like LeBron like up and under slam. Nope, he's in front of everybody. He was just in a better position than other people. That's that would kill the <laughs> NBA offense. That would bring it back to the fifties when like it, it was. There was no shot clock error. Like, Actually, oh my god! About that, I just saw a TikTok. Speaking of like cherry picking and like fast break, I just saw a TikTok the other day. Like, do you guys remember when Lamelo Ball had like that ninety point high school game? Yeah. Because, like, obviously yep. Lamelo Ball was like notorious for cherry picking, but like they broke down that game, and like more than half his points were like legit like buckets. Like he didn't even cherry pick on all of them, which I found interesting. Like they showed like they did it in like parts. And his and twenty of his first twenty six points were like legit baskets. So he only had three off cherry picking. It's the it's the ball name. Like if you if you are a son of Lavar Le- Le- Ball, then you get you know you get scrutinized immediately. So you know there, there's no there's no escaping it, no matter how talented and good you are. I mean, I'm pretty sure we all know that the Mellow Ball is the best ball player right now. Um, no, I'm just not. Well, because they're saying Lonzo might be out for even next year. Lonzo's out for at least two more years, I think, which is That's pretty insane. pretty hurtful to say. I mean, honestly, it's it's a, it's devastating, man. I'm. <clears throat> it, he was going to probably be the the uh, the one that kind of steered the Chicago Bulls into a better direction, uh, especially with that great stretch of months last season with Ball and Caruso just kind of being like the dynamic duo with um with first team defensive level it's pretty tough to see honestly uh and you got to blame the, the shoes you got to blame the zo2 for that <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know, i'll go back to those fucking zo2s oh my god i had a friend that bought those they were terrible really yeah like tore in half on them like did you put them on no i i wanted to be able to like uh wear shoes that i know like i could walk around in and not feel like a pompous you know what in i guess it's like, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll wear a pair of sketches before I wear a pair of zo 2s I don't even oh, hate, like, the balls yeah. or anything, but it's just like, I don't know. Efficiency. Well, I, yeah, I just, the anything. problem I had with it was they charged, like, $500 for a regular pair and then 1000 if you wanted them autographed. <laughs> they you forgot That's about absurd. that. Like, I That's actually thought oh it was a nice shoe. Like, it's a cool-looking shoe. It's but cool, then, like, yeah. Hearing how expensive it was and then Andy saying that clearly they don't even like work that well. Like it's almost like Zion shoe that exploded in March Madness a couple years ago. Oh, the, that was the Duke UNC game. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Tickets were like going for thousands of dollars if he blew his uh, foot out of his shoe like 30 seconds into the game. I shouldn't be laughing. That's upsetting. But like, I don't know. It's kind of funny. 
He's no, I, kinda, I find it kind of funny. Out of all the yeah. ways that something can happen in the game, your shoe explodes. Just, was your your feet's too big. I don't know. Yeah. He's a large <laughs> man. It's Zion. I mean, what do you expect? That's true. It's uh, what Charles Barkley said. If, if, if Shaq and Charles Barkley had a baby, it's Zion. You know? Zion. Yeah, yeah. He's he a lot of gumbo in the world. He can't, man. He he, uh, he can't. No, nah, he, he was also uh, also a player that I really like. was hoping to, to get a bounce back season. And for the most part, yeah, he had a really good bounce back season. The Pelicans were you know, as high as the two seed um, back in December. And then injuries, injuries ensue sort of like shortly after, and the Pelicans are pretty much fighting for a play-in tournament. But I doubt that they'll make it. But, yeah. Yeah. What? What? Um. Do you do you guys see the Lakers making the play-in tournament? Based on their stretch of game so far. They're sitting in the ten spot right now. I believe yeah, they so. are. Yeah. They're in ten. I think they'll maintain uh, that spot. I think so. I actually, I think they're gonna. At least temporarily, I think they're going to get a little higher to like the nine, eight range because the Timberwolves are injury played right now. Like Anthony Edwards is hurt right now. I think Rudy Gobert is hurt. Carl Anthony Towns is hurt. Um, and like honestly, the Lakers have been looking pretty good post deadline. And yeah. they said LeBron. They announced earlier today LeBron will come back at some point this season, like in the regular season. So, um. I think they're definitely going to be in the play, and I just I don't know where. I do see them holding on to that ten spot. I mean, I don't think the Pelicans are going to take it just because without Zion they haven't been the best. I mean, their toughest competition for that is like the Jazz, but I think the Lakers are better than Jazz. So, um, oh, oh, for sure, yeah, yeah. I was about to say too the Rockets. Uh, then the Rockets beat them like a few games ago. The Lakers. Yeah, no, the Rockets are like they—they they have a winning record against the Lakers this season. <laughs> <laughs> they just match up with them so well. I, I just really they do. I, that bad loss to the Mavericks too, a couple days ago. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think, I think if they get in, they should be good though. Like honestly, they get LeBron back, the pieces that they have around them, um, probably a little bit more consistency from uh, Malik Beasley with his shooting because. Um, He's a streaky shooter at times. I think that kind of plagues them in a way. And But you do have the D'Angelo Russell effect where he doesn't turn the ball over as much. You know, he's going to make the right play. Uh, so they they have the pieces. I think they can scare a team potentially if they get in the play game. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with that. Um the other, uh, the one point I want to bring up is I think all the question marks surrounding this team involved like, you know, what are they going to do without LeBron and how are the new pieces going to play? So, like, you bring up Malik Beasley, you bring up D'Angelo Russell, um, uh, Vanderbilt, and stuff like that. We, we're talking about them this whole time, wondering about them. And then Austin Reed scores 35 last night. <laughs> what the hell's going on there? Good for him. I didn't know he had it in him. He's got the Caruso effect. Yeah, it's the. The, the white guy played for a big market? Yeah, white, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which the NBA media loves to hype about, which is kind of annoying. I don't know. It's just <laughs> every time he's like a, a player from a high market team, like whether it's like the Lakers or Knicks or, or, or any any like white player that scores like 30, 35 points, it's like they're they're like the second coming of, of, of like, I don't know. The, Larry Bird. Yeah, Larry Bird, exactly. Yeah, Larry Bird. Perfect analogy. No, it's like that. I just don't get why the NBA media likes to hype that so much. I, I just I just don't get it. I, guess, I mean, yeah, I if I had to take a guess at it, or like take a jab at it, is it like, obviously like Alex or, or no, Austin yeah. Reed is a yeah. uh, just like a random player, so like like a mediocre player, and it's kind of just funny that he just erupts for thirty five. And I think that they're kind of doing it as like just like a joke, like just like for someone to talk about because they don't because like there hasn't like obviously there's been like good like white players in the NBA, but like. Uh, like they're just like good whatever and they're kind of just like making it like as a joke like for the media whatever like uh, I was seeing like one guy was like on Twitter saying like Reeves is the new white mamba Brian Scalabrini like type thing like, <laughs> oh, they're geez. just looking at it for like memes oh like, at this point I, I honestly think like the like the real media like first take ESPN and, and uh, you know um, and others I, I really think that they, 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 they believe that like this is something to talk about. This is something that is important to talk about. Awesome, you're scoring 35 points. 
Um, I guarantee you, if it was, uh, like, I don't know, uh, a Spurs player, a, a white basketball Spurs player scoring 35 points, nothing. Barely getting anything. Like, no press at all. Like, Doug McDermott goes off one night. Has like yeah. 40 and they're like, who's Doug McDermott? Who's yeah. that? <laughs> can, we, like, can we pull up this guy's stats? Where do you go to school? I don't even yeah, know. Who, who he play for? <laughs> like, Great. Like, <laughs> another, Long gone Tigers. No, no. Yeah, another episode of... Uh, Another episode of Charles Barkley, who he played for. Jesus <laughs> Christ. <laughs> yeah, and that that's a good yeah. point, too, I guess because... I, I always play into it, too. Oh. Go ahead, Mish. You can go ahead, Andy. I, I was going to say something quick. I definitely always play into it, too, because, like, I don't know, just, like, you see them, like, put this guy... He apparently is, like, the poster child of the NBA, and then everybody's, like... I don't know. You go out, and, like, some white guy's, like, really hoop, and you're like, oh, there goes, like, Caruso. There goes, like, Austin Reeves, and, like, it's... I get what you're saying, though. They really like want to put it in your head for some reason. I don't know if that's because the media wants there to be a white guy like the poster child of the NBA. Because like, I don't know, his last white MVP, Steve Nash, right? Yeah, back to back too. I mean, that's a different story. But hey, it should have been Kobe the second year, but hey, you know, it absolutely should have been Kobe. I don't know what was going on. There. <laughs> that, was, that was we got to we got to investigate that. Man. But yeah, that's a different story altogether. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, speaking of MVPs, though, I mean. Jokic might get his third straight MVP if 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 he uh, if he continues to to to, to um you know put up triple double numbers and the Nuggets to have the first seed they have they have a lock at the first seed right now like I don't think the Kings are going to um, take over this as the first seed as much as the Kings are are having a great season and Mike Brown should be coach of the year for sure uh, yeah, sure you know it's it's definitely the Nuggets uh, first seed this season but they're also saying that maybe Joel Embiid should be MVP like. I think yeah. I saw uh, an interview with Rachel Nichols. Rachel Nichols. Uh, <laughs> he said the magic word. Here. <laughs> I said the magic word. Uh, she was having an interview with DeMarcus Cousins, and she, she asked him, you know, who do you think is the MV, MVP right now in the NBA? And he was going for Joel Embiid. But the way he said it was kind of like Joel Embiid deserves it because Jokic got it already twice in a row. Now it's now it's Embiid's time, not because of the stats. Uh-huh. What do y'all think about that? See that that annoys me because he's going back to this made up term about voter fatigue, voter f- fatigue, and like voter fraud and all that stuff. Like that, oh, because one guy wins it once. Like what? Uh, yes, Joel Embiid is having a remarkable year. Like I saw, like he can become the first center of all time to average like thirty three points a game since like Wilt or something, but. The man, Nikola Jokic, is on, like, the the one seed in the West, the second-best team, or uh, tied for second-best team in the league, locked up as a one seed, and he's averaging a triple-double as a center. Like, that, that that is just remarkable. Like, everyone was going crazy when Russell Westbrook was averaging his triple-doubles um, a season ago, or two years in a row, I mean. But... People were getting bored about it because he just made them look so easy and the fact the way he was doing it in stat padding. Nikola Jokic is getting these triple doubles while contributing to winning. I I just think he deserves it. It, It's a much tougher race than it had to be because there was one stretch where, like, Nikola Jokic had it unlocked, but Embiid is just playing a different breed of basketball. But it's one thing. You can make the debate for either side, but if you're saying that – it has to be Embiid because Jokic has gotten two already. That's kind of where I have the problem. And I'm not even going to lie. I think he, Embiid should have gotten it last year. but I think so, too. If you're hmm. just saying just because he's gotten his chance, then that goes like back to like the whole, like, oh, you get a participation trophy. Oh, this guy won it one year. We got to give it to another guy. Like, hmm. no, you got to pick what it represents. MVP, most valuable player. It's what the award stands for. Nikola Jokic has been – the most valuable player to his team and arguably the league. There's what he does is his skill set is unmatched. Like he can arguably be one of the best passing bigs of all time or the best passing big of all time. It's incredible. Hold that thought guys. I, I think that will take that entire clip about Brian pressing his case for Nicole Jokic as the MVP and put it on TikTok. That was that was remarkable. <laughs> honestly. <laughs> that was I mean I mean that, that's I a good tough, argument man. in itself, man. Yeah, Brian, good stuff, man. Thank you. What, what, what about y'all too? Um, I think it can go either way, but to Brian's point, um, and respectfully, uh, Jokic 
his availability is another thing I look at too. Um, with Embiid, though, if you take him out of the lineup, I don't think the Sixers have a chance night in, night out. Um, and that could probably speak to his MVP case. But I won't go as far as DeMarcus Cousins saying just because Jokic won it that, you know, let's give it to Embiid. No, I think we should look at the seeding. Um, but I will say this um, about the coaching uh, disparity. Like between Doc uh, Rivers and you look at Mike Malone, it, it's not close. I'm gonna be honest, you know. So yeah. that right there in itself, um, true that you have James Harden and Tyrese Maxey, but you gotta look at those other elements. And I think Jokic has a better supporting cast than Embiid does. Yeah. Also, I mean. Jokic is playing on the floor. I, I always see him right at the free throw line, just like looking to do a pass, whether it's behind the back, you know, through the legs or like back to the wings. It's so beautiful to watch. Um, and Bede, for most of Doc Rivers' possessions, especially when they're trying to take the lead, you know, in crunch time, you always see Embiid try to do ISO or then pass it to Harden. And then Harden does a screen, passes it back to Embiid. You know, or, or Embiid is, like, at the post trying to just get to the basket by any means necessary, and then he'll try to, like, maybe, you know, try to, try, try to like, force a foul so he can get two shots. It, it's just, I don't know, It's he has a lot of, uh, there's no, I guess, beautiful, like, sort of variety that uh, Embiid plays, unless he's shooting threes, unless he has, like, you know, uh, enough space to shoot a jumper. But um, in those stressful times, it's just kind of hard to see the Sixers, um, you know, have that case that MB should be MVP um, uh, in, in, in a sense where he's like the re- most reliable guy in the right moments. I mean, yeah, there are some games where he's 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 got the game winning shot, but I can see that there are also other games in the past, especially this season, where they pass to MB and he just doesn't really know how to approach the ball uh, and get it to the basket. That's yeah, kind of I my mean, take. I mean, going off that earlier point about, like, you mentioned, like, Jokic and, like, making his uh, – and, like, the the plays he's making, these passes. Like, he's making his teammates better. Like, Jamal Murray stayed healthy, and he's been looking good. Um, Aaron Gordon's having a career year there in Denver. He's even been even better defensively than he has offensively. And I guess this alludes to Naj's point that um, Denver is more set up around Jokic than – um, Embiid, and it kind of goes back to like this question being talked about, like aside from the MVP race of like if you're just starting a team, would you rather have Jokic or Embiid? I'd rather have Jokic just for the simple playmaking ability. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Um, especially if we go back to day one when you look at Jokic, Jokic came in the league as a playmaker. And B, his health was, like, all over the place, you know. Like, you didn't know night in, night out, whether he was going to be there for his team or not. So, him telling everybody to trust the process, which, you know, it has paid dividends now. But it's like, <laughs> it took almost four or five years after the fact from saying it. Yeah. Uh, and Jokic came out the gate, you know, with uh, the likes of so many people. Yeah. Also, a second rounder too. And B is a um, is he a first overall pick or is he a, a third overall pick? Yeah, yeah. Well, top top three pick. Yeah. Uh, you know, that should be that should have like the makings of an MVP, a top three overall pick. A second rounder in the low forties, the low thirties. I mean, that's that's crazy. He'll be like the first ever player and probably the last to win three MVPs in a row. So yeah, if granted, if he wins this award as the, as the MVP, right? So yeah, it, it is. It, that's the the thing I kind of like about this race so much is that these are two guys that play the same position in the same sport. Yet, like the way that they came into the game, a lot of ways in which they played the game, and the teams that they're on, like couldn't be even more different. So it's kind of like these opposing factions, um, kind of coming together. And it's like, you know, do you want the the big kind of slow but he's crafty he can play make he can, really there's not much he can't do um guy in the west or do you want this other just absolute uh behemoth of a man 
who uh, can score from all over, takes it in isolation, has a bunch of uh, crazy game winners that you see in the highlights and stuff. Um, that, that's another thing, too, in terms of like how voters think. Jeremy, like what you brought up with absolutely like great points, and I, I think everybody here has been talking about great points, but I'm going to touch on Jeremy's real quick in terms of you know how Embiid approaches certain possessions and how he's trying to, like in a Doc Rivers offense or whatever, where he may, might be relying on other places and such as much. And I don't know, because I'm just a dude talking about basketball in his parents' house, all right? We all are, dude. I don't know how, yeah. Thanks. Welcome to the podcast. My, my mom's yeah. over here somewhere. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> no. I'm Mr. Dresser. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, we're all just some dudes, right? But, but yeah, the, just guys the being thing, dudes. Yeah, you know us. <laughs> the thing I wanted to bring up is, like, you know, how much do these voters actually pay attention to that, or are they just looking at the, the, you know, the stat lines that they put up in the game, the stretches that their teams are having, the, the big highlight plays that everybody sees? How much does that contribute to it more than just like, you know, I, not that those aren't important whatsoever, but like just the game itself, letting the game play. Like how much basketball of these of these two, or if you're like a Giannis purist, like some people, of these two or three guys that you're watching, like how much does that play into it? And that's a question I don't know if any of us can answer like confidently. I think it's just something to consider though, because, you know, I think one has more big time highlight plays that have been on there. I, I take that's indeed, but who really contributes more to his team. I think it's Jokic, but I mean, yeah, this is like the question you ask people in basketball is like, you want to see if they know ball. It's like, you know, tell me who's the MVP this year. So I don't know. This is just, it, it, this, this conversation gets more and more interesting every year. I do love well, well, I like Austin Reeves. He's a, he's a real, he's a real player right there. Austin Reeves is definitely my MVP for the NBA. Just, just, yeah, FYI. He's on like ESPN right now. <laughs> yeah. <AR15>. <laughs> <laughs> AR-15. That's one of my favorite nicknames. Apparently, I looked this up at Basketball Reference. His other nickname, other than AR-15, is Hillbilly Kobe. Oh my God. Where's Austin Reeves from? I want to know. Uh, like, I think genuinely, like he actually is from a town of like very few people, and they were making that like such. Oh my God, he actually is. Well, it's funny that he goes by AR-15 because uh, this for all the NFL guys, this draft he's prospect from... Anthony Richardson when he's. Uh, from the University of Florida, he go his nickname used to go by Air Fifteen, and then now with like the wake and like rocket of, of shootings, he said like he doesn't want to be called that anymore. So I wonder if Austin Reeves is doing the same. So Austin Reeves is from Arkansas, so I'm pretty sure his parents own guns. I don't really think it's really in his agenda to um, not want to be called uh, Ar Fifteen. Oh uh, boy, yeah. Uh, That's probably what his parents said from day to day. Like, Newark, uh, Arkansas. Where's that? That's we're, 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 That's fake. Newark is. This is. Oh my God. Population one thousand one hundred and seventy. Oh my gosh. Yeah, now imagine the population when Reeves was born. And he's like what? Twenty something. Twenty four. Twenty four. Nineteen ninety eight. Yeah, I think the population was half that size. Yeah, no, he's definitely he'll, hillbilly. Some. No, nah, I don't know about Kobe. I don't know. That's hillbilly. Kobe's a bit much. Like, there's so it's a, it's a bit much. Guy. It's the infatuation of trying to like equate white players to Kobe. What is that? Like, you get the white Mamba and stuff. Now you have hillbilly Kobe. <laughs> like, I, I I don't even know what's next. Like, what's yeah, the next dude. evolution of that? I mean, I don't want to be here for it. Like, I, I'm not asking. It. Just keep me out of it. I want to switch uh, uh, gears here. Let's talk about the Warriors. Um, the Warriors road and home splits are virtually like yin and yang. They're the exact same. Uh, is there like any reason why that is? Is there like some, some sort of like conspiracy as to why the, the Warriors are lights out at home like with the third best record in the NBA? But then when they're on the road, it's like they, they're like a, they change to a G League team on the road. It's just... <laughs> What's what's going on with that? So it's like, um, it's Jordan pull balls out when he sees his baddies court time. Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, that no, was yeah, that was like a legit thing. Like Jordan, like there yeah. was like because it was like it became a meme. There was like this one time where Jordan Poole saw like this girl um, sitting courtside, and then he like balled out when he was like struggling in the first half or something. Damn. Yeah, it's all about it's all it's all about the pussy, huh? <laughs> Maybe, but in all seriousness, though, it's uh, <laughs> it's not a good look for them, um, because they're right now the seven seed, like perfectly mediocre, thirty six and thirty six, um, if even just half those away wins, uh, or away losses were wins, they'd be anywhere from, uh, like the four, 
like the four seed or even like the three seed. So obviously they'd avoid the play in. I'm not like too worried about them though, just because they're um, a veteran roster. Um, very mm-hmm. obviously Curry is one of the better players on the planet. They're very well coached in Steve Kerr. Um, I know they're dealing with injuries though, because they just lost Iguodala. Gary Payton, I think, is still out. Like he hasn't played bad. For them he the physical. He so yeah, yeah. I forgot about Wiggins too. Wiggins. Yeah, yeah Wiggins is a, is the X factor. I would call Wiggins yeah. the X factor for the team. He is yeah. the he, he is the X factor replacing Draymond Green. Uh, I mean, like ever since he went down. I mean, of course the Warriors had like a like a 500 record but when Wiggins went down way back in like what was it December. Or, yeah, or, yeah. yeah, they got to figure out and start finding a way to win these road games. Otherwise, there's not a snowball's chance on Haiti's hottest day. They're going to win a playoff series. On the <laughs> okay, Brian. Yeah. All, Jesus, Brian, with all these like analogies and, and the take about about uh, Nikola Jokic. What are you on today, man? <laughs> uh, I don't know. My co-host has taken over. That's awesome. Mama, there goes that man. I know. <laughs> That's awesome. But no, in, in all re- sense of reality, it's kind of hysterical that the Warriors' road record is, is what it is. I mean, Curry gets 50 points and goes off. He ha- he still has a – despite all the games that he's missed, he's still going off as, you know, what, 35 years old now? And he's still playing the Curry that he, that he played back in 2016. I think, the, the like, the most – obviously, Andrew Wiggins is a huge factor – in the fact that they can't win road games on defense. But I also think it's Clay Thompson. And I'm not saying it because of his offense. His offense is back. He's always been able to shoot. He's got that shooting stroke back, like 2019 Clay Thompson. Clay's legs don't have the capability of being good on defense no more. He cannot be an off ball, on ball player on defense. He kind of takes himself away from that, from that, from those opportunities, especially after those injuries, because, well, I mean, he, he can't. He's not quick enough on defense anymore, and I think that also hinders his uh, – hinders not his, but the Warriors' ability to be effective on the defensive end. No, nah, that, that's huge because he's not the clay defensively he used to be where he can guard, the, you know, the number two or number one player on the other opposing team. So I, I do agree with that. I think it's a collective thing too, like defensively. Um, you look at – the Warriors themselves, like, they're not a good defensive team as a unit, you know. And in that, you know, it won't help Clay any better, like, to have other people that can't guard. Yeah. Also, a lot of teams that are that see Clay and his uh, defensive uh, liability, they're going to capitalize on that. You know, fans and, and the offense is great with when, you know, the trio of Green, Clay, and Steph are there, but, you know, they're old. They're, they're you know, seven years, um, yeah, seven years or eight years since their 2015 title when they were young and healthy and they didn't have, they didn't have KD. And last, sorry, my internet is going way off the rails today. I have no idea why. A Walmart Wi-Fi, dude. I, seriously, man, that Walmart Wi-Fi is killing me today. Um <laughs> Yeah, I got to ask my mom about that. Um, no. <laughs> no. Yeah, mom, can you can I get more megabytes, please? No. Um. <laughs> the thing about the Warriors, I'm going to compare them to the 90s Bulls from 91 to 93 to 96, 98. The Bulls were able to retain their core of Pippen, Scotty, and um, Pippen and Scotty, essentially, you know. Uh, during 91 through 93, because of course they were young, they were they were coached by um, Phil Jackson. Really blanked blanked on there, but then when they got older and Jordan came back, 96 through 98, they grew from within. They got Dennis Rodman, they signed him, and he was a killer on the boards. And that was pretty much a big three of Pippen, Rodman, and 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 and, Scott, and, uh, and Jordan. They were they were also great on the bench. They had Tony Kukoc, they had Rod Harper. Um, Back then, they had Charles Oakley in the 90s. So, like, they had a lot, a really great bench to solidify their main core. And that's what you have to do as as a team that goes on a stretch of championship runs. Your players, the ones that you count on for the most part, they're going to get old. And they're going to probably get injured. Their legs aren't going to be as strong. And that's what the Warriors are doing right now. And they're not able to replicate that sort of 
uh, resurgence like the 90s Bulls did. And actually, what's funny enough is that Steve Kerr was on the 90s Bulls, too, in uh, 96, 97, and, which is actually kind of interesting. He's uh, the coach. It's a nice little like um, you know connection there. But ironically, with that connection, you, you would probably expect you know Bob Myers to maybe include more of those kind of guys. Is it because of the salary cap? Is it because of Clay Thompson and Curry's contract being absurdly high? That's that's definitely a good point because I mean you could argue you know, I'm not saying they should do this, but like you could argue that you know maybe they need to start considering like making some major moves involving some of the guys that have made up their core for the past eight nine years. As uh, from like the front office owner standpoint, though, like you know if they, if they made like a deal for Clay Thompson, and even if it was a great deal for them. Like, could you imagine that fan reaction though? Of like, it's, it's the fans. It's so annoying that it's, they have it's to the do fans. That. It's the truth. Like, you know, you get rid of Clay Thompson. What's going to happen to ticket sales and morale and just the overall yeah. support for the team? It's it's a stupid thing to think about, but it is a part of the business, I guess. Well, it'd probably even piss off Steph Curry too. Yeah, mm. and locker room chemistry. That's another great point. Yeah, um, because I mean, shoot, those guys have been together. Uh, Clay was drafted. 2012 or 13? Yeah, 12, uh, I think 12. So, yeah, and Curry's been there since 09, and Draymond didn't get there much after that. So, like, you know, those guys, that's all they've known in the NBA is each other pretty much. So, yeah. doing something drastic like that, because uh, uh, the wheels haven't fully fallen off yet, but they got to be ready once it does to, you know, start making those guys, whoever it is. I think the training wheels are probably off, and they're kind of teetering on one bicycle. That's what I think. And that, that, that wheel is Jordan Poole. Yeah, <laughs> we have yeah. Jordan Poole, and 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 behind him are Steve's baddies. Oh God! <laughs> yeah, Steve's baddies. Knicks and Ice Spice shows up, dude. He's gonna go off for sixty. <laughs> Speaking of the Knicks, Brian, <laughs> how how are the Knicks? Good segue, Jeremy. That was good. <laughs> uh, yeah, the Knicks are uh, the Knicks are pretty good. They're on a three game win streak mm-hmm. right now. Uh, fifth in the Eastern Conference, seven three in their last ten. Um, so they've been doing good. Uh, Isaiah Hartenstein's been balling out on the defensive end lately. Um, in his increased role, um, not uh, Jalen Brunson came back, uh, had 24 points against Denver. We missed him. Uh, I wrote an article about it, uh, still waiting for it to be published, but um, talking about RJ Barrett and how he's pretty much stepped up. Um, the last like seven games and the when everyone on Twitter gave the Knicks trio of Brunson, Barrett and Randall the mid three nickname, uh they've been anything but mid. They're both averaging <laughs> over twenty points and four rebounds. So life's uh pretty good as a Knicks fan. Um I don't know if I'm it's because I've been so deprived of good basketball for my team. Uh, I've only really had that twenty thirteen year and then two years ago when they got bumped by Atlanta. But just the way this team plays, like, I legitimately think um, they can make noise in the playoffs. Um, I don't know if Andy's going to agree with this because it looks like we're playing his Cavaliers. Um, <laughs> That's a new I mean, tough we matchup. Did, we've done pretty good against them. Uh, I think it's going to be a great series. I think it's, oh, wow. nice it. nice it's going to be close either way. Like, I think – if I, think, I honestly think if anyone thinks this game goes shorter than six games, they're crazy. I think it's going. I think it's going six or seven either way, but I legitimately like. Am I going to say the Knicks are going to win the top title? No, I'm not that delusional. Is it possible they make the conference finals? Possible. I mean, they've swept. They uh, they went three and one against the Celtics this year. They pretty much ever since Giannis blew up, they always blow out Giannis's Bucks or get blown out. So you never know there. They have a winning record against the Sixers this year. They have finally done good against the Nets. They swept the Heat. Um, they own the Hawks this year. <laughs> Sorry, not. Sorry, not. You, just had to, you had to bring that up, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Because um, the thing oh, is, was like the Knicks, this year's Knicks team reminds me of the team two years ago where they were part of their – the main part of their success was their uh, – their physicality and their heart, um, ironically, but uh, I think their heart um, 
and physicality just got so much better when they got Josh Hart. I was hard. Yeah, I nice, was nice, nice. nice. Um, but I'm. They were on that nine-game winning streak ever since Josh Hart got there. Um, but the biggest difference is from that 2021 team is this team's also like surrounded by talent. Um, like Josh Hart's been great. Emmanuel quickly has stepped up great when Brunson was there. Um, so I, I'm I'm loving what's going on in, uh, with the Knicks right now. They play the injury uh, fatigued, injury heavy Timberwolves tonight at home, uh, expecting a win there. Mm-hmm. I guess uh, going off of what Andy said, the only thing holding back the Knicks from a title is Jalen Brunson and Ice Spice together. So, yeah, and Brian too. Um, I know you talked about the importance of the players and Josh Hart, but you can't forget about you know the man at the top. Uh, with uh, Coach Tibbs, I think he has turned, you know, the, the physicality of the basketball. You can see when he was with the Bulls, like that intensity that they play with and the tenacity, like the same thing with the Knicks now. Like you can tell that he's just a good coach. Like that is flat out, you know, Coach Tibbs. That's funny yeah. you mentioned that, Naj. We, we've been talking about how they should fire Tibbs after the season. <laughs> well, because I've – I, ever since he got hired, I've had a love-hate relationship with Tibbs. Um, I never really thought he was the right coach for the Knicks with the direction they were going. Because you're right, Tibbs is a very, very good coach. But he is only a good coach with teams that can go to the next level, that can make a, make noise in the playoffs. Like, he's a playoffs coach. He's not necessarily a rebuilding coach. Because he's very... His way or the highway, very old school. If he doesn't like you, he's not going to play you. Saw that with uh, Cam Reddish, which he's been balling um, with Portland. Like I never, I didn't want him when they hired him. I wanted uh, Kenny Atkinson or Mark Jackson because I thought they were perfect rebuilding teams. Like obviously Kenny Atkinson got fired with Brooklyn, but he got them to the point where they had a Kevin Durant, a Kyrie Irving, and James Harden. And so he's just kind of the player that I want – or coach that I wanted. But honestly, now Tibbs, has, that love-hate relationship has been more love um, just because the the impact he's made on the court for everyone. And R.J. Barrett, obviously uh, – now, unfortunately, R.J. Barrett's been awful defensively. But last year he made him one of the best defenders in the league, and I still have that faith. Defense is his main focus, and the Knicks have been – a better defensive team. They got Josh Hart as a great defender. Isaiah Hartenstein's a great defender off the bench. Mitchell Robinson's one of the best shot blockers in the league. Uh, so I think that physicality can ha- have them hope help them steal a playoff series or two. I think Cavs in seven. Is that just my guess? I'm definitely picking the Cavs. Brian, you're 100 percent right. There's no way a series goes less than six games. There's absolutely no shot though. Um, I will say real quick about the Cavs. We're also doing all right. We're, we're treading water right now. Seven three in our last ten. Uh, I don't think we're making a run to the top three spot. I think I, I think the Knicks Cavs matchup is all but final for the first round of the playoffs. It seems like. The well, see, one the thing, weird thing is, sorry to cut you off. The weird no, thing is that's like kind. Of, it's like yes and no because I was looking at it because the way the NBA made the schedule this weird uh, is really weird this year. But it's even weirder in hockey. But. I saw that the, the Cavs' next two games are against Brooklyn. Yeah, and, yeah back to that in Brooklyn. Right? That's right. Yeah, it's, and it's so weird. And, like, the thing is, is, like, the Knicks are um, two and a half games above the Nets, but they're also two and a half games behind Cleveland. So mm-hmm. if Cleveland beats Brooklyn in both the back-to-back, then it's just a huge, like, Gap between the Knicks yeah, trying person. to steal Cle- uh, mm-hmm. the four seed from Cleveland and have home field of, or home court advantage. If the Nets sweep, then there's a possibility that the Nets could take the Knicks spot. I'd prefer the if if the Knicks are locked at playing Cleveland, I'd prefer to have the uh, have home court advantage because even though the Knicks are a better road team, um, the Cavaliers are. A, uh, not as good road team. They're twenty nine and eight at home this season, and they're sixteen and twenty on the road. Yeah. So if there's especially any chance at beating uh, Cleveland, I think it would be having uh, Game Seven at the Madison Square Garden. But it's MSG too, so it's going to be electric. 
a pretty hard feat for the Cavs to win on the road, especially in that in that arena. Yeah, all four famous Cavs fans are going to come out and watch that, I'm sure. That'll be fun. Who are they? Are they like any public figures? Uh, Machine Gun Kelly, MGK. <laughs> um, the God. Miz from WWE. He went to my high school. He's our only notable alumni. Alumni. Uh, that's cool, though. All right. Yeah. Hello. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate it. Yeah. That's yes. nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so th- that's a good point, though, Brian. That the Cavs are a much better home team uh, when those four Cleveland celebrities are there. You know, that, that's very important. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, Megan Fox will probably be there if MGK goes there too. So. Yeah, that's true. I think they're off and on right now, but you know, if they're on. Yeah. You never know. If they're on. They're on. You know, if they're on, then she'll be there. I was at the one finals game when they played the Warriors when Kanye was there. That was really cool. Like, mm, support cool. side and everything. I I don't know. Well, I was I was like back 30. when Kanye was uh you know, like a cool 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 and all and yeah. whatever. Like went in public and people were like, oh my god, Kanye <clears throat> instead of Kanye, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. That's a different uh, conversation. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about my Rockets now. Uh, Yay! So Naj, yeah, on the on cut the nets. Brian talks about his Knicks. I talk about my Houston Rockets uh, as as they are as, as a team, and uh, I, I, you know what? I wish I wish we were, we talked about baseball, not baseball. I wish we talked about basketball like four years ago because that would be my heyday, if you know what I mean. Like, uh, yeah, I definitely would. Um, but hey, who knows? Harden might sign with the Rockets in the off season. There's there's been speculation there. I still say it. I've said this for five or six episodes of our of our lifespan of cut the nets. Harden might sign with the Rockets. He likes what's happening over here. He likes it. But um, the Rockets have been doing pretty well, actually. They, they're like 4-4 four and four in the last eight games. I know that's a 500 record, but hey, like that's better than nothing. Well, they got like 17 wins or 18 wins total in the season. Jabari yeah. Smith. Jabari Smith is, is turning into what Jabari Smith should have been. Yeah, where did that come from? I know. I, I, don't, I don't know. That game-winning shot. Against the Pels? Like, holy shit. That was awesome. That was great. I mean, I got to take the little things, you know, anytime I any, anytime I need to, you know, anytime I can. So, Jabari Smith, that was, shout out to you. That was awesome. That was amazing. Um, Thank you, Jabari Smith. This episode for you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I wrote in my article that Jabari Smith was a C- minus on my grading for the rookies from uh, picks 1 through 10, but he might be a C. He might raise up to a C. So, you know. Professor yeah. Metzner being a little generous. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. A little generous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, as much as I like the Rockets winning, uh, especially as of late, um, we still need to compete for, you know, Victor Wimbanyan and Scoot Henderson. We don't want to lose those picks. I personally think Scoot Henderson uh, will be better for the Rockets if James Harden doesn't sign. Uh, I think he'll be much of a better floor general. Wimbenyana might take away uh, touches from Shangoon, but there's been some talks that Shangoon might be a trade piece for the Rockets. Because, oh. yeah, might be a trade piece because of his stint, his uh, good stretch of games in January and February. He's kind of trickled off in the month of March. Um, but, hey, there's some speculation there. Uh, as, as forgettable as the season has been for the Rockets, uh, it's nice to see him win something, you know, sometime. It's nice to see him win. So uh, that's my statement. Um, I don't really don't care what – I mean, actually, they put the Warriors today, and the Warriors are on the road. So if you're going to like to bet, <clears throat> I would definitely bet for the Rockets to win. I, I would definitely bet the under on that one. I have them plus nine and a half. It's funny you bring that up. <laughs> I'm really tonight, baby. Yeah, let's go. I, I really, honestly, I really see them, them being the Warriors since it's in the Toyota Center. Uh, you know, yeah. but uh, man. yeah, yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird phenomenon the Warriors have with this road record. Yeah, because uh, they're on the flip side. I feel like they can win on any night, but yeah. on the road, if if a series was predicted to be, let's say, you know, they go four games or something like that. They're going to lose all four of those games in the playoff. Mm. Like, on the road, you know, like, that's how bad they are. I think they're, like, what, seven or eight wins and, like, 26 or 27 losses. They haven't won a road game since, like, January 30th, I believe. Yeah, they're seven and 29 on the road. It's ridiculous. Yeah. 
You say how yeah. much? Seven and twenty nine. That's crazy. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, also, KPJ has been uh, pretty good too ever since coming off injury. Um, he's on that uh, weird contract where, yeah, it's a four year deal, but um, you know, Raphael Stone can can uh, opt out of it if KPJ doesn't produce to the quality that they expect. Uh, but you know, yeah, KPJ has been going off too ever since his um, his long um, his long win injury on his toe uh, that was leading back to uh, the beginning of the year. But uh, yeah, that's good too. Jalen Green had 40 points uh, last game, which is which is uh, also nice nice thing to say. You know, the Rockets are they, they got pieces. They just got to be coached well. Um, I think Raphael Stone is a much better GM than anybody has ever anticipated. I think that Silas is not the greatest coach, but he's you know he's going to give them minutes. He's give them, he's going to give them touches. Um, I don't really see him as the coach for the future, though. I, I really think that they should sign, I don't know, like Ime Udoko or something, given all the sexual uh, scandals that have gone on with him. Yeah. I don't even think they're that bad, honestly. I think, you just like, cheated. Like, you just cheated, but it was with consent. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, <clears throat> yeah, he pulled a Bill Clinton. That happens a lot in the industry. Yeah, well, yeah. it's not good. It's, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I want to, I want to, uh, also speak on Jeremy's point about the team. I think another thing about the Rockies, they lack the veteran presence. Like they, they are so young, you know, like so you don't have any pe- people around that can really help them out. I think they had Eric Gordon. He got traded, um, you know, which didn't really help anything, but I think they need more like superstar veteran players like to sign there. Harden. James Harden. <laughs> I'm still I'm I'm praying, y'all. I'm like I'm praying. They need the uh, Miami they need uh their own version of Udonis Haslam in Miami. Just that old guy who like just sits I, in the bench. Boban. And does. I would say they got, Jimmy they got, Butler. Jimmy they got, Butler. They got, they got Boban. Boban Marjanovic. Yeah. Yeah. Butler but Boban ain't got, ain't Boban without Tobias Harris. I miss Bobby and Toby. Bobby and Toby. Bobby and Toby. <laughs> <laughs> But to your point, Naj, on Jimmy Butler, I, I think Jimmy Butler doesn't want to join the Rockets. I just don't really feel like he wants to join them or or, or get traded, for that matter. Uh, oh, I was speaking I was speaking more towards Andy's point about he was talking about a veteran. Or oh, you know, have, yeah. You know how Jimmy, he joined the Heat, you know, <clears throat> not too long after they go to the finals, even though it was the bubble finals. Uh, they still reach, you know, a championship game. I yeah. think they need something like that. I do too. And it, it's a type of veteran player that is willing to help out the young guys. Because, like, so I went to Media Day in September and I got to interview most of the players on the Rockets. Um, I got to interview um, Shangoon, Green, uh, KPJ, KJ Martin, who's having a fantastic season, underrated quietly. Um, that interview with KJ Martin, though, it was. It it aged like 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 old milk, because every reporter asked, "So um, how is your trade scenario going to happen? Are are you going to be uh be able? To, are you going to still be on the team as as uh your your um your antics about wanting to get traded from the Rockets to the team is that how's that? What's the progress on that? And then like Raphael Stone had to had to jump in and goes, "We are not discussing any trade talks right now." And then KJ Martin was like, "Yeah, I'm just." And it's just gonna play my team, my game, man. He was just saying the same answer over and over, and we thought that he was gonna have a bad season, but no. Turns out, like, we love him here. We love. Him. We want. To, we want to keep him. He's the starting small forward for for Houston. Um, but to your point about veteran players, I, I feel like because Eric Gordon during his interview, he didn't really seem like too excited to be a part of the team for Houston uh, mm-hmm. before. Um, the preseason game started because during media day, of course, yeah, he wanted to retire as a rocket <clears throat> because of, of the Houston rocket success when he first started on the team. Um, but after his, the whole, you know, roster moves and rebuilding change, he didn't really seem too happy about coaching the young guys, but he was you know willing to do it in, in case, you know, that would increase his trade value if he, if he was giving more touches to the ball, which is probably why I think that's why he was starting. And I, and I totally was like against it, but, um, to be a veteran player, you have to be willing to sacrifice 
your minutes and focus more on your leadership. And I don't think Eric Gordon was ready to do that. He still has enough in the tank to be a great bench presence for a contending team like the LA Clippers. It just didn't seem like he was really all in on the Houston's uh, rebuilding um, era. So, um, like I said, I think Houston needs to figure out if they can find an impactful player who's willing to work with the young guys and make them better, James Harden, or maybe a Bulbon figure type player where, like, you know that he's had some great playoff success early in his career, and now he's at that age where he's not really contributing as much, but he's giving out leadership um, experience to young guys, telling them where they should be in a possession, how to carry themselves as players, especially with them, you know, being an average of like 21 years old in the NBA, you know, stuff like that. So I think that's a, that's what the Rockets should, should uh, start, start looking for in the off season. Those two types of uh, archetypes. Yeah, that's what I thought. The, I, mean, I know, I don't know if he added like a, a super lot of value to the team or whatever, but I always felt like Kevin Love kind of did that in Cleveland. Even, even when Kyrie left, even when LeBron left, he always was kind of just there kind of having that presence there. And now that I feel like the team has success, and obviously he's now with, not just team, he's now in Miami doing this thing. It looks really weird to see him in a Miami jersey, by the way. I know maybe it's just me because I'm a Cavs fan, but, like, it just don't even look good. Maybe because he's got gray in his beard now. He's an old-ass dude. I don't know. But I always felt like th- that's what uh, he provided to that team in terms of, you know, I mean, we had, especially this year, now that we had uh, Jared Allen and Evan Moby, you know, we have those, those two – Young guns, they're both under 25. I mean, if you lump in, you know, um, Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell, I know Donovan Mitchell was kind of a superstar in his own right in Utah. You know, they, these are still guys that are two, three years out of school. You know, they, they only were legally uh, allowed to drink, like, very, very recently, you know, and uh-huh. in, in the most competitive uh, basketball league in the world and stuff like that. These guys need a sort of mentor like that, whether it's, um, you know, we, we'll go back to Houston. They, I whether it's somebody that has that playoff experience that comes and does that, or just an old head like Udonis Haslam, granted he's won two titles or two or three or whatever it was, but just an old head like that just to come in. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I let him know. You know yeah. Yeah. Um, whether it's just an old head like that, that's just always been around. That's I, I think it goes a long way. As somebody who's never played past high school, I'm sure it goes a long way, you know? Uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to the pod after James Harden somehow goes to Houston and it's just you screaming for 60 minutes. Dude, I'm going to be wearing my, my jerseys. I'm going to, like, take a shot. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be just throwing up confetti and champagne bottles. It's going to be it's gonna be legendary. We'll just have to sit here and watch, too, because I think it should be, you're going to be so excited about it. Just talking yeah, about it'll it. just be a party of one, um, you know, in person. But virtually, hopefully a party of four. But you guys... You got. You guys will be like those people that um, feel sorry and didn't want to be invited, but came anyway because you guys felt sorry. That's that's the um, that's oh, look right there. Scare me. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, but yeah, that is cutting us episode thirteen. Hope you guys enjoyed listening and watching. Um, be sure to check out all of our other podcasts, <clears throat> all of our social media. Wrinkles in the Crease, Harvard Huddle. The onside Take is a live stream on Twitter that is hosted by Eric and Jacob. Um, Naj and Andy, thank you for joining us. For all of us at uh, Cut the Nets, I'm Jeremy. It's Brian. Uh, we'll see you guys next time.